welcome back to another episode of Charity Questions from the Directory of Social Change. And today we're here with another guest. We're here with James Lewis, who's not just the founder, but the CEO of Action for Elders. And today we're talking about James's experience working in the sector, what it's like starting organisations and driving social change and also the future of the charity sector. So welcome, James. Thank you for joining us today. We're glad to have you here. How are you? George, thanks. Uh, it's great to, to be here and thanks for having me as well. I mean, as a very posh introduction, chief executive and founder, I mean, it's the reality of that uh, title is, is totally different, you know? Yeah. It's, uh, it's answering the phones, it's putting the bins out, it's all of those things that you've got to do in the sector. So, uh, but uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for those titles. It's appreciated. No worries, no worries, James. Um, so we are going to talk about you and we're going to talk about the sector. But let's definitely talk about Action for Elders quickly and, and just tell us a little bit about the organization, just so people can hear about that as well before we get started. Well, I'll try and be as succinct as I can be. I mean, Action for Elders came into being pretty much around, uh, well, officially in 2011, 2012. So we're pretty uh, uh, kind of recent in terms of uh, the way that charities develop. We've been going for 10, 10 years now. But before that, I was part of a think tank in uh, Sheffield University. That was looking at this you know considerable problem and it's not just in the uk but it's globally as well in that we have more people now um over 65 than we have been born and under five so it's it was the looking at the focus of longevity and how we we could have a interaction in terms of or intervention rather in terms of ensuring that people whose healthy age is still statistically 63 but they're living to 85 and 87 on average um, how we could help that uh, uh, process in terms mm. of getting them to have a, 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 a better quality uh, later life. Perfect. And, and I think probably a growing need as well, actually, it sounds like. Well, it's, it, yes, it is a growing need. I mean, it's been called the second biggest challenge that we face mm. in, in, in uh, society. Mm. The first one, of course, being climate change. But um okay. Yeah, but uh, it is a huge, huge challenge for us. And one that kind of dips in and out, sometimes it becomes, you know, newsworthy and the next, then it gets mm. buried. Uh, and then it comes back up again, as it has done recently, because there's been a lot of uh, new research on uh, the, the uh, interaction between the mind and the body and how that affects aging, um, which is good because, again, that's what Action for Elders came about and, and had a look at was the, was the fact that that if you had a uh, an outlook on aging which is positive, that would generally ensure that you could live longer. And now research has proven it. Are we about to have a visualization podcast? This is this is what I'm here for. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. No, James, I I don't know that research that that well, but I can believe that myself as someone that practices that kind of positive outlook. Nice. Um, so this isn't your only experience in the sector, actually. So I'm just going to load load this question up and just send it off and see where we go with this one, James. Why do you work in the charity sector? Well, I, you know, George, I got to say that uh, it didn't come natural. Um, and I think that there are three three types of individuals that uh, find themselves working in the sector. One is the individual who has a career and, and looks at it as being a career. And most of those are in cosmopolitan cities like London, et cetera, et cetera. Then you've got the individuals that uh, want to give something back. And uh, I've never quite understood that term, but, you know, they're there. We had uh, the, the same <laughs> point at DSC actually about that term. Sorry to interrupt. And, and then the, the third type of individual, which is where I come in, was that, uh, you know, everything is going quite nicely, you think, in your life, and all of a sudden you're hit by what I call uh, an exocet, which is something that comes completely out of the blue, which affects you and changes your whole life. And with, with uh, us, it was the, the uh, diagnosis of a uh, uh, child at th the age of three with a very rare form of cancer. Okay. So uh, as a result of that life-changing experience, mm. Uh, you know, I decided to, to divert career paths, which was a heck of a risk at the time, mm -hmm. and come into the sector. Wow. Yeah. And, and it's uh, funny how you you can view your life differently, isn't it, in a, in a moment like that? And thank you for sharing, James. I'm sure there's some people out there that can reciprocate that. So so getting to where you're at now then and looking back at everything you've accomplished, what projects are you, are you most proud of? And Not necessarily Action for Elders specifically, but obviously if there's any projects there, then please share them. 
That, that sounds like one of those interview questions, doesn't it? You know, you you before the board, and what what have you, what have you done? Which, which which you're most proud of? The um, next one's going to be where do you want to be in five years? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, my answer to that really is that I'm still still trying to look at something that I've, I've been really proud of. Mm. I mean, I think that the you know Horace Mann, uh, who's the father of American education. I mean, he once said, "Be ashamed to die until you have won some." victory for humanity mm. and I don't know whether I've won that victory for humanity yet but it but it, with the things that I've done I suppose the focus is on uh, uh, implementing new and innovative uh, programs in health and social care mm. and I, you know that where, whether it was a pediatric oncology nurse in the community or whether it's it's what we're doing today in terms of the combination of the you know the the, the mind and the body for for older, improving older people's health. So those are the things that I think that if if uh, if I was to look back and think, okay, what have I done that I'm really mm. proud of, other than my family mm. and being mm. married for 45 years, you know. Congratulations. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, it's that sort of focus. Mm. And actually, what was that? So you said Horace Mann. What was that quote again? I think that was really quite powerful, actually. Uh, Horace Mann, let's see, I can remember it. Be ashamed to die uh, until you have won some victory for humanity. Mm. And, it, and that really kind of sums, you know, a lot of what I, I, I focus on now. And what I, I believe that. in my mm. belief system is that uh, it's made a difference in my life. Mm, mm. and it's broad as well isn't it you could take that in a number of ways but absolutely yeah. the charity sector lends itself to that and social change in general or maybe as we'll discuss later not being a charity and still having that vision is something that's possible as well um so kind of alluding to what might stop somebody from being able to deliver social change then have you found any barriers during your career that's maybe been making it harder to do certain things and have you overcome those barriers in any way again it's, that's a, it's a very sounding interview isn't it actually it's a good point <laughs> Uh, well, how long is this interview going to last, Josh? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that, that one of the things, I mean, looking back when, you know, when I started, um, and I mentioned the fact that, that uh, if there has been a focus, it's been on the, the implementation of innovative health and social care services. Mm. Uh, you'd think that you'd be welcome with open arms mm. uh, to do that. Mm. But in fact, in the majority of cases, uh, you're not, um, and I and I think you know. In my early days, uh, obviously, uh, having uh, the death of one's child and then moving into the sector, it, there was a lot of um, of opposition because I was introducing new uh, services, um, and there was a lot of op opposition to that. As if you know, he, here he is; he's not going to last very long. He's 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 got a lot of grief on his on his shoulder, and that's that's what's motivating him. Mm. So there was that sort of personal kind of attacks that I um, had throughout the uh, throughout the career, in terms of once you want to do something which is innovative, which you want to do something which is well, you know you think is of benefit, which of course it is. You, mm. It doesn't automatically mean that you're welcome, you know, with open arms, and so that is is a barrier. Mm. And I think that. Um, you know, one of the, the, the plus points of the sector is its diversity. Definitely. But at the same time, I think it's one of the, 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 the negative points as well, because there's a lot of, of um, dare I use the word, duplication. And mm. then there's not enough partnership going on between the organizations to find out mm. in terms of, of, of research, which is what we did with both the the, the, the children's charity and with Action for Elders, we did the research, we did the mapping exercises, we found where's the niche that we can go into that will create a benefit to society. And I don't think enough of that is done. Mm. So there's a lot of, uh, I can go on, but you know, let's leave it on, uh, at, at that for the moment. No, I, I like that. It's a, it's a good point, isn't it? And uh, we try and teach this at BSC. It's almost about not necessarily the charity itself, but the projects it runs. And those projects can be interchangeable with other organizations in some capacity. And yeah, can we put shoulder to shoulder with each other, actually? And silly things that we talk about at BSC. Well, it's not silly, but you said the climate earlier. 
can we make a decision in marketing that's more sustainable might it might cost dsc money right but we're not creating a problem for another environmental charity by doing that actually and mm. I, I like that vision james it's definitely something i i, I buy into as well um, so something here that uh, one of these questions that came from our director of policy, Jay Kennedy. And so something you might be able to answer, James, here, but we're talking about overseas charities as well. And, I'm, and so we're not sure about your 100 percent about your experience there, but we'll be interested to see what you think of this. Um, so what's very different in the UK than, than elsewhere? Do you have an opinion on that, James? I have an opinion on most things, George. <laughs> so... <laughs> You're going to do fine. So, You're going to be fine then, aren't we? I'll be fine on that. I mean, my experience with overseas charities, I founded uh, uh, one in the, in the US many years ago, so um, I have particular experience. And the, but again, it's, you know, di different countries. Uh, uh, I mean, in Europe, for example, where I was closely involved with um, um, a huge brand uh, who tried to introduce volunteers. Um, found it very, very difficult because mm. the culture of volunteers in this particular country was unheard of. So, you know, there are, whereas in this country, uh, the UK, then um, we call it the voluntary sector. Now, I'm not a fan of that term, but, mm. but particularly, but there's no doubt that there, there is a, um, a culture of volunteering in the UK, which doesn't exist in, in other, in, in other um, countries across the world. Mm. I think that in America, again, my experience now that, you know, uh, every country, every continent is different. It all has mm. its, it, 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 its um, uh, you know, kind of it's slight changes. But in America, I th there is an attitude which we don't get in this country, which is more, I suppose, um, business-like, corporate, you know, the marketing elements of what you should be doing and mm. how you should be running it is uh, philanthropic there's a there's a culture of philanthropy there which mm. we 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 are not really seeing in this country yet mm. although people and friends of mine are trying to change that but uh um, it's huge in the states so you know there are there are different uh slightly different things but i think the the, the main thing that unites everyone in the sector whether it's in the uk or globally is this um, uh, wanting to do something for whatever cause it, it is, whether it's, mm -hmm. it's here or whether it's abroad, and which mm -hmm. benefits humanity? Absolutely, yeah. We're not selling software to banks, which which may help no. in some way, but it, but yeah, it's definitely <clears throat> something that we can get behind, isn't it? In most organisations, anyway, in, in the sector. Um, mm -hmm. So so let's say I'm sat here then, and, and there'll be people listening to this that might be kind of thinking the same thing I am. Uh, so I have an idea for for positive impact, and maybe I even know the beneficiaries. They've told me that they want this. There's a clear project in mind. Um, so traditionally, registered charities, the route, and, and probably still currently, that's still a great option. Um, but I'm wondering if you think maybe slightly differently is CIC an option, CIO, kind of some of the other models there um, for someone looking to deliver social change. What would you recommend? I would I would go for a mixed model, really. Okay. Um, I, I you know again when I started there there, there weren't too many options, so mm, it was a registered exactly. charity or a registered charity. Yeah. Now you have a, a social enterprise, you have a yeah. community interest company of yeah. which Action for Elders has one. Yeah. So okay, we great. have so we have a, a a mixed model. We have we are a registered charity and we community interest company, and I think that there are, there are different vehicles um, for doing different things. Mm -hmm. So I would say to to anybody that's starting off now, really investigate what the model mm -hmm. can do mm -hmm. and how flexible is that model? Is it the model you can work with? Is it the model that you can get funding with? Because mm -hmm. uh, that's, okay. you know, that's really um, uh, the bottom line here because uh, one of the, and each one has its positives and negatives, which is why I'm, I'm advocating the, the mixed model approach. Because again, you know, if you're starting off, uh, and I've started now three three different charities from from a standing start. And when I say a standing start, I mean zero, no mm -hmm. money. Yeah. And so that is probably the most challenging and the most difficult. And if you are a social enterprise or CIC uh, in particular, then there are not many options for funding. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of those options, of course, is a loan. And if you go down that route, you've got to pay, you've got to service the loan. 
how are you going to service the loan? Because you're not technically, um, although some of the CIC models that I see now and businesses I see, they are producing products and things like that and selling, mm. et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of CICs, and like, well, I mean, charities, uh, the majority of them fail within three years. And three years, uh, yeah, mm. on average. Um, and CICs within three to five years. Mm -hmm. Business is the same, actually. But, you know, <laughs> it's, it, it's all, it, it, it's a constant challenge, particularly if you're starting something. It's not just enough to have an idea. Mm. You, you know, it's not just enough to have a business plan. Mm. Uh, I mean, again, going back to um, the early days, I mean, and this is how naive I was because I come from a, a you know, a senior corporate background. So I've, I, I knew very little about charities mm. and how they worked. Mm. Uh, in fact, nothing at all, really. So, um, and I thought, okay, so we got this credible idea. You know, we, we, we've got a community, we've got a community nurse which does wonderful work. The money will come rolling in. Uh, guess what? It didn't happen. So uh, you learn a lot of lessons from that. Uh, mm. From that, and um, I mean, I, again, it, it's it's about really having the tenacity, the perseverance, the belief in what you're doing, mm -hmm. and and who will benefit from it. I mean, Absolutely. again, today, okay, so we've been going ten years. We're facing huge challenges right now in the sector, challenges that I've never seen before. And uh, uh, many will not survive mm. unless you have that tenacity, you have that uh, particular skill set, I think, which which separates you from everybody else. I find that, yeah. And we're going to talk about resilience later and potentially we can dig into, into that then. So the CIC side of Action for Elders, what does that do? <clears throat> that is That was a form for predominantly uh, trading uh, purposes of commercial contracts. Yep. And so it, it has picked up uh, a few commercial contracts because, again, you've, we've got two entities. One is a registered charity and the other one is, is as I said, the CIC, yep. uh, uh, linked together by an asset lock. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and, it, and even though they've got two separate boards, et cetera, et cetera, limited human resources mean you, you can't focus on one without uh, affecting the other. Mm -hmm. So the what we are beginning to see now, what we started out and the reasons for the for the CIC were, were to identify commercial partners and to have commercial contracts. So we just picked up one uh, with the prison service, and um, uh, yeah, and there will be more like that. But it's more of a commercial animal rather than um, you know what the charity is. It's a charity. They're both there to meet a need, but in a different way. So um, yeah, the charity is is. Uh, uh, um, really focused on on communities and uh, the the beneficiaries in those communities, whereas the CIC takes a more business like and commercial approach to to where it sees this income deriving from. Nice, and I think that you said that asset lock does this can contribute to unrestricted grants or, or not grants? Sorry, but unrestricted money for the registered charity side of it. Yes, it does. I mean, I, you know, again, I could, I could, I could. Uh, I mean, maybe this is, you know, a time to to, to speak about this. Um, Let's do uh, it. Yeah, yeah. One, uh, you know, the factor which I think is detrimental to the sector in lots of respects is this huge um, gap between unreserved, unrestricted monies and restricted monies, mm. particularly as you're starting out. I mean, the you know the route to uh, for charities to to go down uh, as startups is is really pretty limited. It's grants, grants, exactly. um, yeah, yeah. And those, you, if you're running an organisation, let me let me say this. Um, and I'm I'm a student in organisational development, which is, doesn't mean much, but I understand how organisations you know, uh, develop yeah. o o over the time. And I mean, th there are two things which I think are important. Uh, one is that you have to build in the culture. And I think that is particularly important. Um, Building the culture. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. For, for, for a charity. Um, and in fact, it's more important than, than it is for a business. But very few businesses have that culture. And the businesses that do have that culture will thrive continuously. Absolutely. But for a charity, yeah. I think it's a must. You know, if, mm. what's the point of having a charity if you don't have the culture and the believing in the work that you do? Mm. So that is, you know, that's that's that 
is, is so important. The second thing is that as an organization, you should be able to control your own destiny. And that is the same for a charity as it is for a business. The more external stakeholders you have, the, the, the more difficult it is for your, for your development. And if you are funded by a number of funders who all have their own agendas, mm -hmm. then it's more difficult for you to ultimately control the destiny of your business. So the sooner you get out of that scenario with minimal external stakeholders, mm -hmm. you know, the better it is for your organization. And that really is difficult to do. Mm. It's very challenging and it takes it takes a long time. Mm. I, I think let, let's dig into this. I think this is, is so interesting, James. And I guess I'm thinking stakeholders in organizations. Of course, if you had lots of lots of individual stakeholders as in people, that would actually be good, wouldn't it? And that is that resilience we're looking for. So I, I think you said it there, this is hard to do. And I think a lot of charities in this position, I've been a trustee, the charity I was a trustee of, exactly the same position. Three or four big grants a year. I think we got about 15 pounds a month from two individ lovely individuals that kept our heart garden going. That wasn't much resilience there, was it? Um, so yeah. if you wanted to go from this model then of grant funded, predominantly grant funded, try and build some resilience, let's say you've got three years to do this, maybe you've got a budget to do this. What would you be looking to do with that organization, James, to make more resilient? Well, look, there are, there are a number of answers to your question there, George. It's, it's quite loaded. It's not, a, it's not a simple answer. It's not a simple process to do anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, uh, um, I just wanted to, to reiterate, really, that there's, there's a number of answers to that question that you've asked. And I suppose in, in some ways, this is where Action for Elders is right now. It's moving from stage one of an organization's um, development, which is usually, you know, one person, two people running around doing everything, mm -hmm. to building a firm infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But then realizing it can't do that through grant funders. So therefore, it must look at other areas to diversify its income. Now, here's, here's the thing, though. To be able to do that, it has to have the money to invest in it. Mm. Now, if your money has been restricted to deliver projects, how can it invest in areas where it needs to build sustainability, build resilience? That's the catch-22. Absolutely. And that is something, uh, you know, that uh, I don't think that the sector is very good at, at uh, dealing with. The development I think the side, yeah. yeah. I think the sector is too reliant on having a grant in from you know let's say a statutory body yeah. and it's a large it's a large grant and they think everything's okay you know that's going to come in every year but what they, they they don't take into account is that that's an external control on, on your business mm -hmm. and sometimes as happens in life nothing ever stays the same mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i don't think there's enough thinking and thought processing processes uh, to what is going to happen if that the worst case scenario and you you lost you know two or three of your of your funders we see this as well and this doesn't happen yeah it's a common problem you know you you cannot ever uh uh relax i, I don't mm. think in I don't in the sector driving uh, um an entity like this forward mm -hmm. but there's a further challenge and that challenge is the reluctance of, of funders, and it's it's not just funders. I can give you an example of even people that have philanthropic intent, mm -hmm. where they are reluctant to pay for what I call them the central services of an organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you might call it cool. Mm -hmm. So, I like what you said. Wh yeah. Why is that? The answer is, I, it's again there are a number of, of answers, but it never ceases to amaze me that there's this negativity associated with charities having central ma management, fundraising, or administration mm -hmm. um, areas. It's frowned on. Mm -hmm. Why is it frowned on? Mm -hmm. Because if, if you don't have those, the charity cannot develop, the charity cannot build itself, the charity can't have its resilience, and it, 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 it comes back down to why is it its reason for existence? 
Now, I understand that there are different levels of charities and that complicates it as well. You've got your small local groups, but, you know, you've got your medium size and then you've got your... I understand all of that. But at the same time, I think it, 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 one of the ways to affect change is to educate. Mm -hmm. And we don't do enough education mm -hmm. we, as charities. We, we, we are, uh, if you like, not um, uh, strong enough, I think, at times to challenge why the heck don't we get core funding, central funding? I mean, the, even the regulator yeah. has produces negativity towards the sector. If you go into, you know, a, a you don't uh, have to tell a, me that. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you, if, I mean, if you go into the website, if you look at Action for Elders, okay, you yeah. look, you obviously see the, the level of our income and uh, everything else, but also you'll see that there are no people here paid over sixty thousand pounds. Straight mm. there, it's it's a real kind of hits you in the eye. Why is that? What is that mm. saying? Mm. Is that saying that any organization that pays somebody over £60,000 is irresponsible? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing? Or because that's the impression that it's having, and then you've got the media picking up on that, and all the negativity of people on in the sector should not be paid this, that, and the other. Of mm -hmm. course they should. Are mm -hmm. they affected? Is the organization affected? Yeah. That's the focus, not who's being paid what. Because the other thing you you you, you are, I'm on my soapbox now, George. Don't worry about. No, we're going there, James. I think there'll be a lot of people resonating with what you're the the other thing that it's not doing is it's not attracting the talent that the sector needs. Mm. So because who you know wants to, to have their salary float floated around and say or or maybe you know I'm earning. 80 or 90,000 pounds and it's out there in the public, you know, knowledge and people then thinking of it negatively. It's not the fact that it's out there, but people think of it negatively. Why do they think of it negatively? Because the media and then you've got the regulator doing it. I mean, what hope is there for the sector? Those things have got to change. Absolutely. And until those, that kind of thinking changes, I mean, uh, you know, the, a friend of mine, and if I made, if I mentioned his name, you'd know him. Okay, he's, he's he's renowned renowned in the in the sector. I'm not going to mention his name. All good. Go uh, I, he did. Um, uh, he was a chief executive uh, um, a while back of um, another organisation. Uh, I'm just thinking now if I mention the organisation, <laughs> we'll know, know we'll who know. he is. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so I mean, he was focused on you know this 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 uh, um, why are people reluctant about investing in core and da 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 da. And about five years ago, he published together with an organ another organization. They published, uh, you know, the the um, a study on this. Mm. And his opening paragraph was along the lines of, "I've been champ championing this for twenty years, mm -hmm. and it hasn't changed." Mm. So, you know, you asked me earlier on, didn't you? What, you know, what what uh, uh, has changed since I started, or mm. hasn't changed? This is one. Of, this is one of those areas. Yeah, I, you know where, and how are we going to change it? We're going mm -hmm. to change it by by discussing things like this. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. both of us are in the sector, so we have an experience. But there are other people in the sector that would that would not, uh, uh, you know, they'd be only too happy to criticize what I'm saying today mm. because they don't understand it. Well, so you know yeah. that, that, and until we have that sort of education, where it it. You have to invest in these, these services you, because it builds resistance. It builds sustainability. You have to pay people an appropriate wage because, largely speaking, they will, be, they will drive the, the effectiveness of the charity forward. Mm. These are the things that have got to change in the sector. Mm. And we have to educate the public. Well, and, and indeed certain people in the sector. And the funders. And the funders. Yeah. We have to educate all of them into into you know, what needs to be done, why it mm. needs to be done, and why paying somebody an appropriate wage or indeed paying uh, people in administration or management or fundraising is Whatever not it is. a negative. Yeah. It yeah, is yeah. a way to build the resilience of the sector. Absolutely. And it's not 80% of the money goes to the cause. It's 100% goes to the cause. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Always.
Yeah, I love that, James. And, and we, as a fundraising trainer, we talk about the responsibility of organizations that do have endowments and things like that, that pay all of their core costs or whatever you want to call it. And then they get to apply for these lovely projects that actually are probably 8K, 9K under, whatever the figure is, below what it would cost another organization to do that. And how can they show their finances in a way where actually that shows the funder, well, hold on a second, we're paying this because they've got this but this is not the normal cost of this project. And then, so there's involvement on, on both sides, isn't there, to be able to... Well, I mean, there is a, you probably heard of it. There, there, there was a study a while while ago, emanated from America, Harvard University. Hmm. Um, and it came over here, it's called the Starvation Cycle. I presume you've heard of that. I'm not going for it, I mean, maybe. Then. No, okay. Well, the Starvation Cycle, it, 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 basically what it's saying is, is that charities will always uh, not go for a full cost recovery mm. when they're going for grant funding they because the, the fund is controlling the amount of money that the charity can get mm -hmm. so that's the first thing they will always under cost what the charity uh, sorry what the project is actually costing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because the the limit of the uh, of the monies has has been set uh put by the funder yeah, yeah. that's the first thing and then the second thing is is that they will always exaggerate what they can deliver. Mm. And the reason that they will exaggerate what they can deliver is because of the competition of other organizations they know are, all, are exaggerating what they deliver. Mm. And it's called the starvation cycle. And mm. the starvation cycle, if you continue to do that, you will eventually, because you're continuing to lose money, you, you know, you're trying to, to compete with organizations on a false basis. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a it's a marvelous piece of research, um, and uh, you know anybody that's that's watching this or listening to it today, you know, just type in on Google the starvation mm -hmm. cycle and um, uh, let's see what comes up. Perfect. No, I hadn't heard of that, James, and I, that makes a lot of sense. And I think it, it, even just the language starvation cycle, it feels like when I'm speaking to funders or fundraisers, that does feel like where we can be trapped anyway. Some of us, some organisations, anyway. So we, then this comes back to the resilience then, doesn't it? And so I would teach an organization that, yeah, it'd be great to have endowments and things like that. That's, that's a luxury for some organizations. But one way to build resilience, individuals, having a base in your community that give and, and recognize. Um, would, would you say anything to that, James? Would you be looking to, be, as a CEO and a founder of an organization, are you looking to grow that part of your funding? I think we're looking to grow a number of parts of our funding, George. Mm. And, that, and that is definitely one, you know, one area. Um, but as I, I've mentioned, and I don't want to put people off, you know, this, this is a difficult, a really difficult and challenge, challenging thing to do. And um, I mean, we're just launching a thing now called um, uh, Action Is, and mm -hmm. it's 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 um, it's a branding for us, but it's about volunteers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, we are. The way that we're doing it is slightly different, I think, mm -hmm. <laughs> because one of the one of the things that we've always wanted to do is, if we're having a volunteer, then we want that volunteer to benefit from being involved in the organisation and learning new skills and really beginning to connect and realise, you know, this is of value. I'm getting value from it, and I am delivering value. So, uh, and we we kind of wrestled with this this kind of challenge because what we didn't want to do is just put out there we want volunteers, mm. and then you know what we're going to do with them? Oh, you can you know move move um, paper around in the office or you make people a cup of tea. No, you know it's not it's not that. Yeah. So anyway, we've, we we've come up with this and we 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 are going to focus on. Um, I mean, there's a thing called the census framework. I won't bore you with that. It comes from a piece of research in, in, in yeah. Sheffield University. But right now, there's there's a lot of uh, attention and quite rightly on loneliness. Mm. And loneliness in society is a real, real challenge. Mm. And um, But it's different from social isolation. Mm. Loneliness is a very uh, personal negative emotion. And the and the way or one of the ways to reduce loneliness, we think, is by in having people that are skilled in again, I use use the census framework, but their particular it's a relationship centered piece of, of research mm -hmm. uh, uh, when you're talking to um, uh, older people in particular. 
so it's learning those skills and having a one-to-one listening year to build relationship and trust in that individual. And we believe that by doing that, we will help to reduce loneliness. Because what people, I think, in the main don't um, understand is that, yes, you can bring people in a group, and that has many benefits. Um, but when you go, when the person goes away from that group, they still mm-hmm. they go back to a lonely environment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you've got to, you know, to deal with loneliness, you've got to really uh, focus on personalization, Absolutely. that person's personal feelings. So there we go. So we're going to launch that. That's a, you know, but then by doing that, we hope that these people will begin to to raise money for us or uh, in the community. Exactly. Spread and, the word and, at uh, minimum. Yeah, yeah, spread the word. Yeah, raise our name awareness, and and I, I think that one of the things that again we have to give more attention to is our messaging. Mm. And the, a messaging for an organization has to be very clear and very simple, mm-hmm. um, with due respect, and also. We used to call them case studies back mm. in the day. We call them yeah. storytelling now. Yeah. And, you know, you've got to be good at storytelling. You really do. The, yeah. uh, again, I think that one of the things that charities don't do in the main is they don't emotionally connect mm. with with individuals. Mm-hmm. And I think that, again, as part of the uh, the exercise that we should do is that why are we di- – why is the sector different? One of the sectors – one of the reasons is we want to affect change. We mm-hmm. want to help human beings or humanity per se. Mm-hmm. How are you going to do that by not emotionally connecting? Exactly. You know, we all run around doing busy lives, doing this and that, just to survive. Hold on a moment. Let's go beneath what we are. We are emotionally charged beings. Absolutely. Let's get back to that. And you've got to get the costing right and you've got to get the performance measures right and all of this stuff. But we want those funders, we want tears on the page, don't we? We want to be able to get them to understand our story. Um, I love that, James. And yeah, case study storytelling is definitely more cool to call it storytelling these days, isn't it? Um, So we spoke about core costs. We spoke about kind of resilient fundraising. Um, I'm just wondering maybe any other debates that kind of have been going on in the past and, and are still going on as well. Any other things in the sector that are worth talking about? I think in the main, uh, George, it's about that, you know, it's, it is about that change of getting people to understand how the sector operates mm. and not being afraid to say uh, that, you know, I'm proud to work in the sector, not, oh, my God, I'm taking X amount of money. Mm. And I, you're mm. feeling guilty about it. Mm. I think people should be more prouder of saying I'm working in the sector because I want to affect change. Coming back right. to Horace Mann's, you know, original thing that I, that I put out. And, but I, it has to be done on all sorts of levels. Mm-hmm. It's not just the public. It's not just the media. It's government. Mm-hmm. And it's our own regulator. Mm-hmm. You know, if our own regulator doesn't get it, <laughs> what are we going to do? You know, it's, it's about We're that so sort of interaction. That. We're so far past that. I think it's, yes, I don't, let's not go too deep into it. But I, I think we can do a lot without the regulator being kept up as well. I, I mean, we've seen it in other industries. I don't know. You're you're right though. I, I'm just a bit exasperated actually. Like trying to get them to help us. It's there's a lot they could do, not simply, but there's a lot they could do, right? And there's a lot of low hanging fruit for them. And none of us have low hanging fruit left. It feels like in organisations, it's all big stuff. Um, mm. It's a difficult one, isn't it, James? Okay. Uh, any, anything else? Any other kind of trends in in the sector that that are similar to the past? Um, nothing that I want to, you know. <laughs> Keep, uh, no yeah, uh, I think uh, we, we, we're getting to the end of that time. We, I mean, we've been let's uh, future focus. Let's okay. go one more and let's mm. think. So, so what about if uh, an organisation maybe going into the future? Is there anything you're thinking about as a CEO of Action for Elders, and maybe on your horizon, we need to be mindful of this coming up in the future? Is there, are you thinking about anything like that, James? Well, I mean, the first thing, George, is that, to focus on the survival of where we are right now and building the resilience of of where we want to be. I think sustaining what, what is and and uh, building what isn't is mm. the is the strategy that we are following. And and that is, is that's what yeah, sustaining what is, building what isn't. And and uh, you know that's a very fragile balance in it. Mm. Um, but you, again you've got to look forward. 
you know, if you've got something of worth, whatever it is, and you want to, you know, with with the work that you're doing, it's the same thing. You want that to uh, be sustainable. You know the value of it. I mean, we measure everything that we do. And I think that's something, again, that charities should be doing more of, but mm -hmm. don't, which is measuring mm -hmm. their impact, measuring mm -hmm. their social return on investment. And uh, I mean, we've done it from a, from a, you know very very early days, and it's a very robust methodology that we use. But it, it's 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 about really building on that, and then uh, getting the funding that is uh, that is necessary um, in not just one income stream, but a diversity of them, and ensuring that your organization is sustainable to actually. Um, uh, actually progress through whatever challenges there are because of you are adamant that the worth that you're doing both to individuals and society is worth that pain love it Max, amazing james and and i'm sure there's a lot of people thinking this is why we do this and maybe they've been prompted to go and do some more performance measures or to think about some resilient fundraising today um, but ultimately, we, we are all connected by this drive for social change. And I think you've summed it up very nicely, James, and some definitely great quotes in there as well. And great to hear about your experience running, obviously, a, a younger organization for, for children. And then obviously now where you're at with action for elders. Um, so as I say, thank you so much for, for being here, James. So a couple of jumping off points for people. There was a lot of research in there for people to kind of Google, uh, which, you, which you said at the times. Um, but also if people wanted to maybe learn more about action for elders, do you want to quickly give the website? and then also james where people can find you as well well <laughs> they can find me right here um <laughs> so <laughs> the yeah the website thank you george for allowing uh, us that we're we're on www.actionforelders.org.uk and obviously we're on facebook we're on twitter we're on tiktok we're on instagram anywhere out there on social media you can find us under at action for elders Amazing. and thanks thanks very much for allowing me the time to to uh, um, vent my uh, <laughs> frustrations, I won't. I won't call them anger. I'll call them frustration. Mm. But mm. Uh, you know, hopefully, there are people that have listened to this podcast that can connect with what I'm saying. And you know, if they can, I'm I'm very willing to uh, have a conversation with them further. Uh, you, you can find the email addresses for us right on the website. Yep. or even the, our phone numbers, but uh, I, I really do hope that it has been a, a beneficial podcast in, in some way or other. Definitely, James, and I, and I think sometimes even just giving people that emotional, finally, people are talking about what we feel, and, and, and if that has resonated with you, just know that we're also having these conversations internally at Directory of Social Change. Our job is helping you to help others, and we do a lot of that by lobbying the government, so any stories you can bring to us and to, to me, George, or any of our team at DSC, we'd love to hear that as well. And who knows, maybe you might end up sat uh, on the other side of a, a Zoom call from me one day telling your story to, to all of our listeners as well. Um, so as I say again, thank you very much, James, for, for coming along today, James Lewis from Action for Elders. Um, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for watching Charity Pressions by the Directory of Social Change. So this is the podcast where we bring charity experts to you and we ask them the questions that you provide us via social media. So if you want to get involved, please check out the Directory of Social Change on Instagram, Twitter or LinkedIn. And of course, to hear more about this content and to learn more about charity questions, subscribe to our YouTube channel now. And of course, like this video to let us know if you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching. Cheers.